Welcome back to another episode of Inside Icon. Today with me, David, is Min. Min, welcome to the show. Well, pleasure to be here as always. Yeah, uh, once uh, a month, one time with Fez, uh, next month with me. Um, how has your month been? The month of September, that is. Ah, oh, man, September. I mean, one. Uh, I was finally able to meet you in person, so right. that was great. <laughs> um, so as you know, we had the Korea Blockchain Week where all the ICOM members from around the world um, flew into Seoul, South Korea, and we had our ICOM workshop, which turned out to be fantastic, uh, a great experience. Obviously, um, we had some good intense discussions we could go into that a bit further if you want mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. and then after that i had a partner workshop so these are uh, c-level management from uh, parameta and a few other uh, you know related affiliated uh, companies and projects we met in uh, separately had a a separate workshop where we got into more intense discussions on kind of the future planning and the future of crypto and just very, um, you know, impromptu discussions around any subjects that we want to bring. So um, a big difference between the ICON workshop and the partner workshop was ICON workshop was very organized um, as you Remember, we had every day, every hour sort of scheduled uh, for the entire three days, like, you know, even like where, what time you're going to wake up to, what time mm -hmm, you're going to go mm -hmm. to sleep and all that, right? So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, whereas the partner workshop was we have, you know, it's a three-day uh, session, but we each brought what we wanted to talk about and had a very deep, intense discussions around those. And um, I'm still digesting uh, a lot from those meetings yeah um and then i got back to the u.s and you know what i've been doing for the past week uh so it's only been a week and just following up and digesting some of these meetings and trying to uh, plan things ahead of time yep yeah um agree on the uh, icon workshop uh great stuff very nice to be able to yeah. meet uh people you work with uh in real life, it's so different to shake hands and speak when everything is 3D as opposed to this uh, 2D setup that we've gotten so used to. So that was very yeah. good. Um, all right. Well, I'll, I'll rewind a bit um, and ask about the Korea Blockchain Week, which is the big like, Korean uh, conference mm -hmm. that was uh, on at the same time. Um, for you, seeing that... Uh, in 2023, was the vibe or the buzz different than it was in previous years, considering market sentiment, or was it just as packed? What What would you say about that? Uh, that's what's very interesting. Uh, since you asked that question, is that it is actually my first time in Korea Blockchain Week, and right. it's actually last year I could not make it, and the couple of years before that we had COVID, so. Uh, nobody was traveling. Yeah. And then right before COVID, I think we only had one Korea Blockchain Week. So Korea Blockchain Week started a few years ago, but it stopped immediately due to COVID and then it resumed last year. So I think we only had like three Korea yeah. Blockchain Weeks officially. Yeah. Um, obviously, I've been to Korea many times through business travels and met you know, went to a lot of other uh, side conferences and things like that. But, you know, I think officially this was my first time okay. uh, <laughs> there. Um, but to, I can't really compare or yeah. benchmark, but what I can say about the vibe this year was that um, I think most of it was expected. It wasn't great, but it wasn't bad either. Um, I think the market or, you know, the, the sentiment around uh, the crypto industry, you know, given the macroeconomic economic conditions, it's, you know, we're hoping for the best to come, right? So yeah. 
uh, we're hoping for a rebound. So yep. some of the key themes that have been popping up is I think a lot of people are hoping for the or waiting for the Bitcoin ETF approval in the mm -hmm. US next week. I mean, next year. Um, Bitcoin having uh, to happen next year. And, yeah. you know, hopefully that would uh, lead 2024 as the turnaround year. Um, so, you know, historically, I think, you know, kind of the trend and sort of the, you know, some of these kind of good uh, Bitcoin uh, events that we're expecting, uh, I think 2024 is where everyone's crossing their fingers and hoping it to be a good year. Yeah. Same, um, um, actually. You too? Yeah. I mean, you met a bunch of people, so I would say, uh, and then we, we talked too, right? So, yeah. yeah. What what does your gut feeling say? Do you think it's going to be 2024 turnaround year or do you think it's going to be priced in or whatever and it turns out to be 2025? Um, my personality and also being in this industry is um, never get your hopes up <laughs> or else you will be disappointed. Yeah. So um, it's always great to be uh, prepared for the worst. Uh -huh. And that's all I can say. So yeah. um, if, if, it, if it happens to be a great year and that'll be great. So I'll be extremely happy. We'll, we'll all be extremely happy. So uh, I mean, that's a, that's a great scenario, but I'm not going to get my hopes up and get disappointed. Uh, yeah. I'm just going to, do what I always do. I mean, you know, plan things for the worst and make sure that, you know, the icon project continues on and survives. And that is, that is the plan. So, yeah, but kind of going back, you know, I think um, a lot of the projects and teams that we've met in Korea blockchain week, um, they are in survival mode. Um, mm. And it, it kind of felt that these uh, a lot of the attendees were looking hard for something positive and try to find a way to be reassured that the market will come back in 2024 or sooner than later. So, um, yeah, I think that said, I think the Web3 um, industry sentiment specifically for Korea uh, was quite negative. Um, I don't think anybody in our industry would be blunt and go out and say that, you know, our industry is doomed. This is like, we're seeing the worst. Nobody will, you know, outright say that because, you know, it's, uh, we all sort of wear that mask, but, you know, just being very truthful here, I do think that uh, the, you know, I, th I do think Korea is actually at one end of the spectrum where it's actually quite negative. Okay. Whereas I've been hearing uh, the events in Singapore, the, the token 2049 has been a bit more balanced and uh, a bit better. So yep. uh, I think there's a lot of positives happening outside of Korea, such as Japan, Hong Kong, Dubai, you know, a lot of these countries are becoming more and more crypto friendly. Um, I think Korea, we shot ourselves in the foot uh, with Terra Luna, you know, and then the whole FTX cycle just did not turn out well. And the regulators are on, you yeah. know, on it. So, you know, I could go on and on on this. But, um, you know, I think we're all hoping for the best. But, you know, Korea's uh, I think Web3 scene currently looks a bit bleak, but there are some positives around the corner, such as some of the larger gaming companies are starting to feel more and more comfortable with like play to earn models and NFTs and their the learning curve has kind of kicked in for uh, the, the large gaming and, and conglomerates. So, you know, I don't know which direction things will go in the near future, but, you know, I would, you know, I think it is, you know, Korea, like I said, is currently at today is at the, uh, you know, the, the negative sentiment is, is outweighs like all the positives. Yeah.
maybe not the best place in the world to do a temperature check on Web3 yeah. uh, right now. Mm -hmm. Best place, probably Singapore, indeed, uh, two weeks ago at that massive uh, event. I thought 20K people attended. Uh, is what I yeah. read, and uh, uh, generally just hearing positive stuff. So that's then something to hang on to. Um, moving on, in in Korea, we got to meet the people um, at Parameta and the people that work at Hava. Uh, could you mm -hmm. give uh, a small rundown of how uh, Parameta and Hava are doing? You might have more insights from the uh, partner workshops that you did. Um, yeah, a little summary yeah. maybe? Yeah, 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 definitely. So starting with um, Parameta, I would say, you know, I was able to spend some quality time with the Parameta management team um, on the on my recent trip. And, you know, ironically, the the fall of many, you know, kind of Web3 companies and projects sort of elevated um, Parameta's reputation as a differentiated player in the Web3 space. So this sort of kind of came out as a surprise for me. Um, I think when there were many, you know, like during the bull market, you know, Parameta was seen as one of many, many, you know, Web3 companies and projects, right? So, you know, it, it got diluted through all, you know, from all the noise. But now that the noise died down, um parameta actually the reputation like showing that you know you know parameta actually has a business a technology you know spearheads a lot of the projects quality projects like icon you know their rep reputation has been sort of elevated and that was very interesting to hear and you know parameta was recently awarded grade a you know rank by Kisa, Kisa is a, you know, quasi government association um, that rates uh, technology. And so this also kind of came out as a surprise uh, <laughs> for us, uh, for Parameta, because it's extremely rare for, um, because only one, they give those awards, a grade A um, to uh, a company every a few years or so. So yeah. you only get one every few years out of you know, tech in general, all, yeah, tech in general, like all tech, um, including AI and all sorts. So that was uh, a bit sh surprising. So, so after that, you know, Parameta, from what I hear, received the grade. There were a lot of inbound, you know, calls from you know potential investors, so and potential partners. So things have been quite busy. Um, but you know, the underlying fact is that. Parameta has never stopped innovating. So, you know, recently they are building a, even a, you know, it's really funny how from the icon network perspective, we built what we are called core two, right? Mm -hmm. So yep. we had icon one, which was built on Python, you know, core two, which is go loop and yep. uh, uses Java JVM. So that is, you know, that was actually built about two, three years ago. It's only recently we've completed all the, you know, data migration to, and, and we started really implementing these changes. So it feels recent, but, you know, it was a few years ago. Now, Parameta has built a, even a better upgraded blockchain, which could handle uh, you know, theoretically, uh, and this needs to be built, obviously, but, uh, you know, up to 100,000 TPS. And this was specifically being worked on for uh, security token platforms in, you know, in South Korea for working with security companies. So uh, to handle, you know, the level of trading volume, hopefully. Yeah. Um, so, you know, again, my, my point is that Parameta has never stopped innovating it is a a true tech leader, which is very unique in the blockchain space in in Korea. And I think a lot of people are starting to have begun to really realize that. Whereas, you know, now that all the noise has died down, so um, I guess one thing is that uh, you know I think like 
any other companies right now, the firm, uh, you know, downsize and, you know, you know, although 2022 um, being a great year for Parameta, uh, it's been a historical uh, year for them financially, uh, but, you know, they've cut some fat in order mm. to expecting that uh, some bear market and potential recession. So, uh, which is not unusual. So I think it's nice that Parameta has become a bit more lean, um, but it takes financial discipline uh, at times to, you know, manage risk. So I don't think it's out of the ordinary, but I just wanted to mention that, you know, it's Parameta is just a normal company and going through a lot of stuff, a lot of these uh, changes. So yeah, um, while whilst building a uh, new tech that is uh, exactly. continuously innovative, um, when they build new tech, is this something that Icon or the Icon ecosystem can leverage off of? I mean, Yes, definitely. If we choose to, so mm -hmm, I mm -hmm. mean that's. Uh, I think we've learned from the migration from core one to core two. Um, that migration process was extremely pain painful. Um, you know, obviously the you know, uh, there 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 aren't too many projects like Icon or Ethereum that has, you know, changed their entire infrastructure or mm -hmm. migrated. Um, to a newer and better um, improved, you know, infrastructure, right? So, um, you know, creating these blockchain technology is one thing, but migration is just another beast. Yeah. So pick, pick your battles, um, you say. Exactly. So, you know, when the time is right, um, do we, I think we got to think about like this core, you know, does Icon Network need uh, 100,000 TPS currently? Probably not. So, mm -hmm. you know, maybe there, there will be, maybe it might be better to wait for core four and we do a migration later in time. So, yeah. Um, I think these are the choices or decisions that we will make when the time is right. Yeah. Um, but I, I guess for Parameta, the most important thing I should mention is that, you know, Parameta, uh, has, you know, they are true and committed to, um, you know, icon and icon ecosystem. So um, it's always good to be, uh, you know, reaffirmed of their commitment on, yeah. on such. Yeah. And th so then um, what about Hava, which is another mm -hmm. project built on the icon stack, uh, whose team they work together with? Parameta yeah. as well. We're all in this ecosystem, and uh, we got to meet the the Hava staff as well. Uh, more potential for collaboration there uh, on our end, yeah. as they are a blockchain with a certain purpose. Um, w do you have a, a small update on them or any insights gained from uh, these uh, workshops? Yeah, for sure. Um, so similarly. Um, now, I was able to spend some time with Hava management, not as much as Parameta management, but um, uh, but I was able to sit down and talk to them uh, privately and and also attend their um, you know Korea Blockchain Week private dinner event, which was um, I would say uh, extremely successful. You know, when you throw these private dinner events, you you usually hand out many invitations and. Um, surprise, and then, you know, usually during Korea Blockchain Week, there's a lot of empty seats. I was like very surprised that um, all the seats were filled. And I was How many able seats? To, uh, I believe 100 seats. There yeah. were 100 invitations. <laughs> That's quite so, enough. Yeah. Um, Dinner. And great thing is, I was able to talk to, you know, some of their investors and partners, like some of them on our, you know, I was sitting next to them. Some of them were other tables but it was a good networking type of experience and mm -hmm. you know i think hava i was a little surprised as well where they're doing uh very well uh, i mean I, I shouldn't say like i'm surprised that they were doing well i ex we expected them to do well but um just being in um in korea and talking with uh many different people this it was very interesting to see Hava name pop up um, here and there. So um, 
yeah, I mean, a couple of other projects like unrelated to Hava were just you know praising how uh, Hava was uh, you know they were very very they were praising how Hava was executing well in, in Korea. So you know that kind of got me thinking why and um, you know obviously I was able to talk to Hava management and those people and. You know, it seems like Hava did a good job in like solving a very specific problem early on. Um, there, they had one very specific goal of helping NFT projects or NFT membership communities migrate to uh, new chains, right? So, um, when they were talking with a lot of these NFT projects, they were able to understand like one of their biggest needs was like, okay, they wanted to switch to a new, newer chain and Hava actually helped them do that. So, um, so, you know, I think that was a good start for them, but I think the big you know, expectation for Hava that still hasn't been fulfilled is, um, you know, at the end of the day, they are, you know, their biggest promise is to deliver high quality video games and um, Hava, they're working on it and I mean, and the expectation is, is quite high. So we'll see. We'll see how that all gets delivered. And obviously we're, uh, you know, I'm rooting for them. We're all rooting for them and supporting Hava. So, you know, I think it'll be all, um, you know, we're, we're all hoping for the best end result. Because, yeah, because <laughs> what I thought was interesting about Hava is how they specialize in the cross-chain transfer of NFTs. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and the chain itself is built in the same stack as the Icon blockchain. And Icon is, uh, you know, focusing on the cross-chain messaging of general general message yeah. passing, um, mm -hmm. which is another cookie. But essentially, the chains are family. And um, there is a lot of potential for collaboration there. Like Icon could, uh, you know, apps on Icon could function on Hava and the other way around. Um, so that's definitely an avenue that could be explored. There is no yeah. technical language barrier. There is a maybe a real life language barrier, uh, Korean to English at times. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, what's what's great about having a sister project like uh, like Hava is that uses the same technology stack. Is that although we're targeting different uh, user base and we have different visions and goals. Uh, just because on the back end, the technology stack is the same. And, you know, that alone, we could have multiple conversations on how to optimize our relationship. Like, for example, how do we cut costs and make things more efficient? Like, what are some of the problems or features that you need? You know, we, we could, we get a lot of great feedback from Hava. And, you know, and I think that this is, you know, how we foresee you know growing with not only hava but with other you know potential chains so hava is sort of the early test case for what we hope to see as like an icon sdk chain mm. um you know we're hoping to see like more of these uh, projects like you know uh, launch using the icon uh, the platform that we created and then Obviously, we hope to connect a lot of all these projects through the, um, for in this case with uh, the BTP um, and X call. So, yeah. By the way, thanks for the uh, the shirt. Appreciate it. The merch <laughs> X call .dev. If you haven't liked and subscribed already, go visit X call .dev and have a look at the at the tech right there. <laughs> um, yeah, right. Talking about X call, um, let let's hop uh, on forward to the uh, incentivized testnet uh, chat a bit about that we've just mm -hmm. seen uh, winners being announced i think there were 17 uh, winners across a host of categories um what did you think of 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 that and uh, what happens next yeah um obviously uh, i told this to eric and not only eric i think eric um you know, got some good feedback internally from our team members. But overall, in summary, um, you know, this was sort of the first cycle of the public incentivized testnet. We expect to do more of this. Um, so the first ones, 
I think always going to be the benchmark, always going to be the most challenging, always going to be, you know, a foremost, I guess, discussion. So, you know, I think uh, at the first cycle, we've done uh, quite well. We had a slow start, but we've kind yep. of pivoted and, you know, make some changes. And the end result was, uh, you know, we were able to get some very high quality submissions, which mm -hmm. we which was which eventually was the out uh, the one of the main goals. The other main goal is obviously you know to bring in more developer talent from outside of the icon ecosystem into the icon ecosystem to showcase like the X call technology and you know the good things we're doing um, uh, in the icon ecosystem. So I think you know both we've checked off you know checked the boxes. The next step obviously is going to be, you know, the second cycle of this. So we're going to take some of the learnings from the first cycle and apply this to the second cycle. So uh, we hope to, you know, kind of build on this and make it even more successful, which means we'll get more quality submissions from a wider range of uh, developers out there. Um, I would say the ship, you know, right now we are, um, you know, what happens next, uh, I think you asked, was that we're trying to ship uh, Xcall to the mainnet. Um, yeah. uh, I can't remember, but I think we've got it on uh, mainnet on for Archway uh, just this morning. But the, the target is, you know, by end of this month, which is only like a couple of days away, uh, to be officially get everything on the mainnet. And yeah. um with the incentivized testnet, I think we've already spot, you know, uh, highlighted or spotlighted the uh, the winning projects, and we want to give them uh, all the credit and um, you know hand out prizes and all that. So um, and the the I way it, the... it sounds like mm -hmm. the way it will work or goes down is that the um, chains connections get added mm -hmm. to Xcall, but at the same time, the product itself gets improved based off of this uh, feedback coming in from the incentivized mm -hmm. testnet until you have uh, an improved, better connected version of Xcall, and then you're, you, do it, you do it all again. Yeah. You try and get another round of feedback in, another round of usage, another round of developers getting to know the product, uh, and it gets yeah. easier every time. Um, and the toughest one is the first one, and that's just successfully finalized. Yeah, and uh, now we know what we've, you know, what we're doing, what mi mistakes that we've made, and just gotta improve on that. So yeah. work faster and better. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, next steps we're gonna be hopefully integrating and enabling new, you know, solutions, crushing solutions such as Layer Zero on X Call. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know. We're constantly researching and prioritizing which chains or which solutions to, you know, integrate. So we're working on that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the gist of it. All right. Thanks. Um, I guess what we're we're going to try and keep this on around thirty minutes, and I can already see that we're failing <laughs> because I just wanted to then end uh a uh, little bit of rewind back to the uh, the icon team workshops in korea that occurred in the month of september um yeah could you maybe give a rough summary of these workshops and maybe mention uh, a highlight or two highlights if you're feeling generous yeah um i'll try to be quick i mean just to give you sort of the you know so that everyone can sort of picture what we did we had full two days of discussion and one day of uh, team building uh, uh, retreat. So I think most importantly, you know, focusing on those two days, you know, we sort of reiterated every time we start the workshop, we, you know, we pound and re, re review and let everyone know. So we, we discussed like icon vision and mission uh, all the time. So that's how every workshop starts. And we also review, um, you know, our 2023, um, you know, what we've built this year, or I should say, like, what we've built since the last workshop, like, what did we plan to do the last workshop? And did we actually accomplish what we set out to do? So 
how well did we execute? Mm-hmm. So we have a deep discussion and then, you know, if it didn't go right, then what went wrong? Like, how do we fix that? How do we make less mistakes? So we have those types of discussions. And, you know, we obviously X call being sort of the primary focus for the icon ecosystem right now, you know, we went into deep discussion on who are we building this for and how or what are we actually building? You know, how are we going to make this a reality? How are we going to speed this up? I mean, we had discussions around that. Um, and, you know, uh, lastly, we ended with, you know, path to sustainability. Sustainability is one fact that I, I've been stressing uh, for for a while now. I mean, since the very beginning, you mm-hmm. know, we every blockchain or crypto projects need sustainability. So, and this includes like why we built CPS, right? So, uh, how are we going to be sustainable? How do we lower costs? How do we get more validators? How do we make validators happy? I mean, all of these discussions all is part of sustainability. But you know, I I, I would say out of all that, like the key highlight was that, um, you know, we built many, you know, throughout the years we've been existing and working on this for six years now. So we've built many critical components um, that technically, like that makes it technologically possible for ICON to um, become, you know, long-term self-sustainable, you know, crypto project, right? Uh, Mm -hmm. Blockchain Mm -hmm. network. Yeah. Um, I think the next step is to start adding like new revenue streams to the network and actually, um, you know, we need some acceleration or more guidance towards uh, making the icon, you know, ICX token economy uh, deflationary, right? So, yep. um, so we've talked about that uh, quite a bit, but I think out of all the things that we've discussed, I've been stressing that, okay, we need more revenue streams for the icon network and we need, you know, a clear or faster path to, um, you know, making our uh, the ICX a, into a deflationary uh, token economic, you know, token economic state. I would say, yeah, 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 yeah. And and the the um, one of the ways of doing that is by having activity on 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 the network and people to paying transaction fees. Another way of doing that is introducing a product like XCall that solves a cross-chain uh, issue. Um, exactly. So, solves a bunch of them. And uh, getting people to use that, tie it into the network. So these are um, steps towards sustainability, I would then uh, Exactly. Allude. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, that's not a bad, um, that's not a bad ending to, to the catch-up. <laughs> <laughs> that's inspirational. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. Um yeah, I think we'll we'll leave it there. Thanks a lot for for taking the time again. Um if you're uh, listening and you haven't subscribed to the Icon YouTube channel, give it a subscribe uh cuz it helps the content travel further and hang around uh for next month another episode of Inside Icon with Min and it's going to be with Fez and for now uh, we say bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.